um, on behalf of the FASD Network of Northern California, I welcome all of you to this training, FASD in the Classroom, What California Educators Need to Know About Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder. My name is Peggy Black. I'm the president of the FASD Network of Northern California, an FASD trainer of trainers, a parent liaison in California for FASD. I'm also a special educator, a speech and language pathologist for over 40 years. Um, and in addition, and absolutely not last, I am the parent of an adult daughter who has an FASD. I want to let everyone know that she is by far my greatest teacher. It is my job this morning to present an overview of the disability. I'm gonna start off with some fast facts about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. First of all, FASD is the most common cause of developmental disability in the United States and actually in North America. So the first misconception about this disability is that it is a rare one. It is not. It's the most common cause of developmental disability in our country. The other thing to know about FASD is that most people know about fetal alcohol syndrome with its key facial characteristics and other physical signs of the disability. However, only 10% of affected children and adults actually have fetal alcohol syndrome. While 90% of affected children and adults have the same brain damage as fetal alcohol syndrome, but without any outward sign of the disability. An important thing to understand then is that fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is primarily an invisible disability. That is important to know as we think about child find. That is important thing to know if you suspect a child or a, a teen has an FASD, they may be hiding in plain sight. The other thing to know about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is at the beginning, the research looked at um, the face and focused on the facial characteristics of the syndrome. And then the research expanded and focused on FASD as a brain disorder. Well, the research has expanded once again in recognition that FASD is a whole body disorder impacting the brain and potentially every, every developing organ system in the body in utero, depending upon the time of exposure to alcohol. And finally, with FASD as an invisible disability, the sad finding is that 90% of children with FASD go undiagnosed. Next slide, please. A word about stigma. And I bring this up because stigma plays such a role in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, and it's not a role with good effect. Stigma affects not only how people respond to someone who has an F FASD, it affects recognition of the disorder and its import, the willingness of professionals to diagnose and treat, and it contributes to a second misperception, the idea that FASD is hopeless. So why label a child with that disorder? I actually had a psychologist tell me that one time. And I looked at her and I said, but you don't hesitate to label autism. So why do you hesitate to label an FASD? And I want to tell you that FASD is not hopeless. Yes, there is brain damage, but early diagnosis and how we intervene with that child and that teen and adult can change lives and we can help someone reach their potential. There is a great deal of stigma about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder about birth mothers, the affected person and their families. And I want to bring up something. Women who drink during pregnancy do so for many reasons. One thing, the CDC reports that one half of pregnancies are unplanned in the United States. And fetal alcohol syndrome actually occurs only during certain weeks of the first trimester. If you don't know that you're pregnant, when do you find out that you are? 
The other factor is there's a great deal of misinformation out in the field and media and even amongst medical professionals with advice given to women, for instance, that it may be okay to drink wine, to drink smaller amounts of alcohol. And I want to tell you that there is no known safe time type of alcohol or amount of alcohol. So that misinformation is also contributing to the problem. And finally, if you're a woman who has a substance use problem, that problem doesn't magically disappear when one finds out that one is pregnant. So I'm asking you now as this uh, webinar starts to think about stigma and FASD and see if we can put judgment aside. All right, next slide. So what is the prevalence of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder? FASD is a common disability. It is not rare. Two to 5% of all first grade children have a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, two to 5%. And that is actually a conservative number. That means that FASD is more common than autism. Think about the services that are available for autism and think about the services that are available for FASD and the fact that FASD is more common than autism. And in fact, in special populations, the prevalence is far higher. So for those of us in special education, research is indicating that 20 to 40% of children in special education will have an FASD. This is not a small problem. In child welfare, 28% of children in foster care and who are adopted have an FASD. There were over 400 children in this particular study and only two children were previously diagnosed. In juvenile justice, 23% of youth who are incarcerated have an FASD. The prevalence data is, is giving us information that this is a very significant and big problem. Next slide. So why do educators need to know about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder? One, what I just said, the prevalence data, FASD is not a small problem. And I heard people say many times, I don't have a student in my classroom who has an FASD. I don't have a student in my practice that has an FASD. I don't have a young person in my program that has an FASD. I don't have a child or, or an adult that I'm working with that has an FASD. And I guess what I'm telling you is that you do, but you just don't know it. Again, a disability that hides in plain sight. Another factor that is really important for educators to know is that early diagnosis and intervention are key to a better outcome in adulthood. And in fact, the Institute of Medicine reports that diagnosis by six years of age strongly predicts better outcome in adulthood. So finding these kids and diagnosing them are critical. Number three, there's legislation now before the California legislature for FASD to be a name condition under OHI for special education eligibility. Once this happens, school districts will have to begin to develop a response to fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Number four, children with FASD show a neurobehavioral profile of complex learning and behavioral difficulties. These are our kids. And finally, a very important note, assessment, treatment, and educational practices are specific to the disability. That means in an assessment where we do not have an idea that this child might have an FASD, where there isn't that suspicion, there are gonna be key parts of that assessment that are gonna be left out, which means FAPE will not be delivered. And the treatment and educational practices that will be used will not be FASD informed and again, failure to deliver FAPE. Next slide, please. So what are some red flag warnings for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder? One, you have a child in your caseload that is in foster care, adopted, or living with a relative. If the case history shows uh, a history of drug use, think alcohol, 
There are multiple mental health diagnoses. Truthfully, if you have a student who has six different mental health diagnoses, start thinking brain, poor response to ADHD medication, and psychologists, please do not, um, please go back to the former slide. Annette, please go back to the former slide. All right. I think I know what that slide said, so I will just go ahead and, and, and speak from it. Psychologists, test scatter is part of the profile of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So if you see tremendous test scatter when you are testing um, a student, that is not an error response. That is something that is part of the profile of the disability and it is a key red flag. And that, can you go back to the red flag slides, please? Go back, not forward. Excuse you, excuse me, everyone. There it is, thank you. A history of high school dropouts and suspensions, and I'll get to that later. Discipline that does not seem to work. When traditional discipline is not working and you're not seeing changes in behavior, that is a huge red flag for FASD. And finally, the typical profile is, is that receptive language is higher than expressive language in FASD. That profile is switched with expressive language being the highest skill. Next slide, please. So prenatal alcohol exposure and neurotoxicity. So what does alcohol do in utero? Alcohol is the strongest known toxin to the developing brain in utero. Its effects are stronger than heroin, cocaine, and marijuana combined. It is stronger than the effect of meth. And so if there's drug use in pregnancy, think alcohol. It's the alcohol that's really doing the damage and there's a very high correspondence between the use of drugs and alcohol in pregnancy. What does alcohol do? Alcohol toxicity changes the structure and function of the developing brain. Brain damage in FASD, most of all, involves a deficit in communication within and across areas of the brain. Key findings are alcohol toxicity affects cell growth, cell migration, and causes cell death. It alters white matter microstructure and can lead to a reduction in cortex volume. A key finding for what alcohol does is it causes decreased plasticity of the brain which is important in understanding how it affects the ability to learn. And finally, alcohol toxicity damages the development of all neurotransmitter systems in utero. Next slide. There are key areas of the brain that are vulnerable um, to prenatal alcohol toxicity, and I'm not gonna go in depth, <clears throat> Excuse me, but I'm going to highlight a couple. Psychologists, the hippocampus, the memory center of the brain. In testing, take a clear look at memory function. The frontal lobes, in particular, the, the pre, prefrontal cortex, so key to cognition and emotional regulation, parietal lobes and information processing, and the HPA axis. I'm going to stress this one. Interestingly enough, the HPE axis is the stress center of the brain. And what research is showing is that there's uncontrolled release of the stress hormone cortisol and FASD. And think about the high correspondence of anxiety for people who have an FASD. It's about 90 to 95%. And anxiety and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is part of the brain damage. 
um, the basal ganglia, and finally the uh, hip, uh, hypothalamus, which is the sleep center of the brain. I'll get to that later. Next slide, please. So the amygdala in your classroom, the amygdala is located in the limbic system and in, in, in the midbrain, and it's the emotional center of the brain. It's involved in recognition of threat and fear response. And in FASD, not only is there damage done to the amygdala itself, but it appears that the wiring between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, with the latter acting to downregulate the amygdala's response, is damaged. So what is the result? Marked difficulty in emotional self-regulation with adrenaline unchecked and those meltdown and rage reactions that are core symptoms of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And that's not behavior, folks. That's how the brain functions. Next slide, please. So what's the typical developmental profile in FASD? And this is just an example, but what I want this profile to show you is how uneven development can be. And that is a characteristic of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So chronological age may be at 18, expressive language way out at 23, language comprehension at age 10, money and time concepts at age eight, uh, emotional maturity at age nine, and a very significant issue understanding of danger at age six. Again, psychologists, if you see a scatter of skills, that is not an error. That is the profile of the disability. Next slide, please. So before I get into the cognitive deficits in FASD, I want to mention that if you've seen one individual with FASD, you've seen one individual with FASD, that is true for anyone who has a disability. So you'll see a range of deficits, you'll see a range of severity, and you'll see a range of strengths. However, what I'm gonna be talking about are some clear patterns in this disability. And the first one is the good psychiatrist asks his patient, what brought you to our clinic? And the patient answers, taxi. And the doctor is writing concrete thinking concrete thinking and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Next slide. So cognition and FASD. In FASD, there's a generalized deficit in processing and integration of information. A generalized deficit in processing and integration of information. Slow processing speed, a big one, and most important, Executive function deficits are core, much more important than findings for IQ. So psychologists, when you assess a student whom you suspect may have an FASD, test directly and deeply for executive functioning and do not rely on parent and teacher report. As the psychiatrist noted for his patient, concrete thinkers, poor understanding of abstract concepts and abstract language. And this is a tricky one. Difficulty operationalizing words into action. So I can tell you the rule, but I still can't do it. Think of that teacher in the classroom who hears a student state the rule, maybe he be able to tell you why the rule is important. And then that student doesn't follow the rule, doesn't do the action. What is that teacher going to think? that this child is being willfully disobedient. And that is not the case. Difficulty operationalizing words into action. Another key finding in FASD is in the moment thinking and language comprehension deficits. And finally, even more than ADHD, IQ is a very poor predictor of the ability to function in FASD. Next slide, please. So more on executive functioning difficulties. Executive function is important for goal-directed behavior and problem solving, and both are impacted in FASD. What are some of the things you see? High impulsivity, poor judgment, difficulty with initiation, poor organization skills, 
and a big one, cognitive and flexibility. If a teacher is asking a student to do something or is saying something to the student and the student is objecting or failing to move, that can be cognitive inflexibility. A student is stuck. And, and TBI, perseveration, occurs. It also occurs in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And again, that's not disobedient, disobedience, that's how the brain works. Another very significant finding for executive functioning in FASD is decreased ability to generalize. So what is learned with one person in one setting may not generalize to the next person the next time and the next location. And a key thing to remember is there is a significant decrease in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and the ability to understand cause and effect relationships and a poor ability to learn from consequences. Think about how we use discipline and reward systems. Poor ability to learn from consequences. It is not unusual to have someone with an FASD repeat the same mistake, no matter how dire the consequences. And finally, a decreased understanding of time and time management. Next slide. Psychologists and, and educators, memory deficit is core. It appears to be encoding of information is most affected. There's poor recall of recently learned information. So what does that mean? One thing that that means is stories that don't make sense. Students with FASD are often accused of lying. It's not lying, it's confabulation. And again, confabulation occurs in another type of brain injury, a TBI. And confabulation, when one doesn't remember what happened, one fills in the blanks and that is not lying. And FASD can also be the case that the individual may be struggling to understand the difference between what one wants to have happen and what actually occurred. Confabulation, limit ability to carry out multi-step directions. They may know how to do a task at school and not at home. Please, IEP team and teachers, rethink homework for this child. An inconsistent performance is a hallmark of FASD. Now you see it, now you don't, again, like in TBI. And so if you're a teacher who has a child who can do a task and then 30 minutes later, you ask them to do it again, and the child looks at you and does not do it, that may be a function of how his or her brain works and not defiance. Next slide, please. Processing deficits are core in FASD. And this could be a whole seminar by itself. But I want everybody to know that hearing loss and vision loss occurs far more frequently than in the general population. Hearing loss itself occurs at 120 times the rate seen in the general population. How often do we screen for vision and hearing for students that have an IEP? Every three years. That's not often enough for a child who has an FASD. There's also processing deficits. Auditory processing deficits are often the most severe. One example is something that is seen in autism spectrum disorder, poor auditory filtering. And think about that child's ability to understand language in a busy, noisy classroom. It is very common for a child or an adult with this disability to tell you, I get every third word. Auditory processing deficits. There are visual processing deficits too. There can be difficulty in analyzing geometric shapes. And there can be difficulty, for instance, in far point copying and scanning this needed for reading. And there's just an overall delay in processing. Next slide, please. So what's the profile language development? I could go on and on with that because after all, I'm an SLP, but I'm gonna keep it short. Expressive language is higher than expressive language and can be the highest skill this individual has. What does that do? In a person who can speak very well, the assumption is that that person functions at the level that they can speak. 
And that is simply not true in FASD. They can be the ultimate look good kids. There's significant difficulty in processing language, difficulty following serial oral directions. In young children, language delay occurs for some children and it can be shown more in difficulty with syntax and concepts rather than basic vocabulary. And in older students, what often shows is poor understanding of abstract language, poor understanding of metalinguistics, and poor ability to process larger chunks of language. Think of that student in high school with an abstract curriculum. Think of that student in high school with a teacher who primarily lectures. And what is the, going to be the ability of that student to learn in that classroom? Next slide, please. Socially, what do you see? This is a big area in FASD. And in fact, fetal, uh, a diagnosis within fetal alcohol spectrum disorder cannot be made if there's not a social communication deficit. So students with FASD are often friendly but have conflict with peers. This poor theory of mind, perspective taking is affected so that there may be limited ability to understand the intent of others and how one affects others, both sides of the dynamic. There is difficulty with nonverbal communication and understanding nonverbal communication, body language, gestures, facial expression, and difficulty in understanding changes in tone and vo volume and how that carries intent. It's not uncommon for a child or an adult with an FASD to think that the other person is angry at them based on a misunderstanding of the prosody the uh, um, speaker is using. And then for the person with FASD to react that the other person is angry at them when they don't understand why. A very, very specific and important social cognitive deficit <clears throat> in FASD is a poor understanding of danger and risk. And socially and emotionally immature, 17 going on eight, 17 going on 12, four going on two. And how does that play out socially with peers? That concrete thinking also applies to a difficulty understanding more complex social situations and more complex social rules and how that really, really begins to play out in the middle school and high school. Alexithymia, difficulty putting words onto feelings and understanding the feelings in self and others and how that affects social interaction. So these students may not have difficulty starting an interaction and then problems ensue. Next slide, please. This is a big topic for FASD. 80% of individuals with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder have complex sensory integration difficulties. They can be sensory sinking and sensory avoidant. And often there are sensory processing difficulties across all the senses. I have one adult who said to me, mom, if someone could help me with all this sensory stuff, they could change my world. This is a big deal. It's very important to recognize the sensory sensitivity of your student to adapt your environment and also adapt the way that you interact with your student. Think less is more. And think also sensory overwhelm on the playground and in the lunchroom. Recognize the role of sensory overwhelm in meltdowns and behavior problems that occur in your classroom, in your practice, and in your office. And realize that OT services are absolutely vital for students who have this disability. Next slide. So self-regulation, this follows, is a core deficit. I like Linus's blanket, by the way. So what do you see? Mood and behavioral dysregulation, poor ability to calm self, mood liability, meltdowns, and negative affect, kind of just a general layer of irritability, poor ability to sustain mental effort. What is that 
look like in the classroom. This may be a student who is not completing his or her work and is not volitional. volitional. This is not a student who's refusing to do work. It is poor ability to sustain mental effort. Again, that sensory processing issue and poor impulse control. Core deficit area. Next slide, please. Um, Annette, can you play this? No, next slide up, please. This is a slide from um, a professional in, in Australia who um, describes anger and behavioral problems in mountains and FASD quite beautifully. While she's doing that, um, perhaps I'll take a moment to see if I can answer uh, a couple of questions. I'll just give her one, one more second. Peg, there was the question about your stats. Were those primarily US stats or um, where were they from? Uh, they're for, uh, from United States and Canada. Okay, thank you. And Another person is asking um, if if you're going to be discussing ADHD and the difference between difference between diagnosis. I think Dan is doing that, but do you have anything on yours? No, but I, I yeah, there are some things that address, for instance, the differences in adaptive functioning, which are significant between FASD and ADHD. I also okay. mentioned that there's a poor response to ADHD medications and FASD. Um, and, um, I will also indicate that executive functioning deficits are more severe in FASD than ADHD. Um, and that is now only the, um, how adaptive functioning presents an FASD versus ADHD, but that the um, the gap between IQ and adaptive functioning is far greater in FASD than ADHD. And actually there is research that is done and we're using brain scans in, in, in subjects who had an FASD um, uh, uh, versus an ADHD without FASD and the brain scans were different. So not the same disorder. One of the things parents and carers of young people with FASD often say about anger or other outbursts is that it came out of nowhere for no reason. But let's take a look at if that's really true. I'm going to tell you the story of a simple scenario that I see play out even in my own house almost every day. This is Gail. She's just gotten up and she's trying to get ready for work. She's trying to get organized for the day and quite frankly, she's feeling a little under the pump. She's looking for the water bottle she always takes to work. She can't find it anywhere and it's making her feel frustrated and annoyed. I've also woken up and I've come down to the kitchen to get ready for the day. I see Gail and I notice something's up. Because I have good social skills and I can read faces pretty well, I suspect she's feeling annoyed. On top of my social skills, I also have good theory of mind. 
That is, I can imagine how other people feel in different situations. I also have good problem solving skills and I know that I'm not always right. So I can generate a number of different options for what might be going on. I have good language skills so I can ask questions that help work things out. When the person tells me what's going on, I can both manage my own feelings of being concerned or frustrated or flustered and I have the mental flexibility to change my theory about what's going on very quickly so I can respond in a way that's helpful. If someone with FASD enters the same scene, it's not uncommon for things to go very differently and brain-based reasons give a really good explanation why. For example, poor social skills and difficulties reading faces, maybe due to attention, mean it's very easy to make a wrong guess and concrete thinking turns that wrong guess into a fact. Poor problem solving skills often mean that young people with FASD can only come up with a single answer, which is typically centered on themselves. And that's because focusing on them is concrete and answers centered on someone else are abstract. If we then throw in difficulties managing emotions, impulsiveness, difficulties predicting the consequences of our actions, and limited language skills which make expressing yourself hard, you can see how it is super easy for things to go from 0 to 100 really fast. And because we can't see into their brains, we're often in the dark about what just happened, leaving us surprised, angry, frustrated, confused. The tone and loudness of what comes out of our mouth next, even if the words are reasonable, often serves as more evidence for the young person that they were right in the first place. You are angry at them. And then they kick further into fight or flight and they may even escalate into yelling back, breaking something or taking off. So how do we break this cycle and what can we do to avoid constantly finding ourselves in this unhelpful loop? Firstly, we need to consider who needs to change first. The young person's brain still has the same impairments before the scenario as after the scenario. So asking them to change isn't likely to work. That means the person with the most skills and brain-based abilities and the most flexible brain has to be the one to lead the way. And that means it's you and me. The good news is if we've used brain-based explanations to understand what happened, we can similarly use brain-based strategies to change the pattern. Explain by Brain offers multiple suggestions, both before things start to escalate, but also once they already have. So let's explore a couple of the different ways in which we can manage these kind of situations. Externalizing self-talk is a really useful technique that we can use all the time. Lots of young people with FASD seem to have limited inner self-talk and they can't read our minds. So they often have no idea what people are thinking or feeling or why. By stating our thinking and feelings out loud, we take away their need to guess, as well as showing them how they can express things like this themselves. With a different, more accurate explanation, we are more likely, but never guaranteed, to get a different reaction. Role modeling responses we want them to learn can also be helpful. Again, by externalizing or saying out loud what helpful strategies would be and doing them, our young people see us walking the walk. They see what the strategies look like in practice and they may be able to give a different response themselves. You can modify this approach slightly to instead of jumping off straight into solutions, turn this into a problem solving practice. We can role model looking for multiple solutions and showing mental flexibility. We can modify this again slightly by doing this problem solving collaboratively with them, positioning them as someone with helpful skills, an expert, so to speak, in looking for other solutions and valuing their input, which is great for the relationship. Empathising, which is simply reflecting back feelings, is another powerful option that can be used. When we empathise, we're not agreeing with what they said or how they said it. We're simply reflecting and validating their emotional experience. Sometimes strategic ignoring also comes into play. In this example, you're ignoring how they said what they said 
and the inappropriate words they used and instead we're focusing on their intent and the feelings underneath that. It's much harder for people to stay mad at someone who is genuinely trying to understand you and showing kindness. If a young person's emotions have settled and they're no longer in fight or flight mode, you might also try a do-over. A do-over provides a young person with a chance to start again and do and say things differently. They don't receive any consequences for their first attempt. You simply give them an opportunity to start again afresh. You might give prompts like, you know, what other words could you use? And of course, when they give an even slightly improved version, you give them lots of praise. The next step up from a do-over is a role play. Now remember, you can only attempt this if their emotions are regulated. Otherwise, suggesting this might accidentally trigger them back into fight or flight mode. But with a role play, you act out the whole scenario again, this time with the new and improved words and actions. Finally, sometimes our guys and us are just too emotional and too activated to use any of these strategies. This is when we really need to focus on getting everyone back to a place where they can listen and learn. When we pick our battles, we aren't giving up and we aren't giving in. We're just being smart and we're pressing pause for five minutes, 30 minutes, a day, or sometimes even longer. The idea is for everyone to reset their emotions and then we can circle back to the issue and retry one of the earlier strategies, but starting from a calmer place. Returning to our original question, with FASD, does anger really come out of nowhere or is it just hidden? I think we all know the answer. For kids with FASD, missing skills and impaired brain functioning is almost always the invisible answer. As parents and carers, as well as educators, it's our job to do our best to understand why our guys do the things they do and say the things they say and to use brain-based strategies to teach them the skills they need. Believe me, I know how challenging this is, um, but also how rewarding it can be. If you've enjoyed this video, please share it around. If you want more information about the Explain by Brain book or the Explain by Brain online parenting course that this resource is based on, please follow the links in the notes below. All right, next slide, please. Scenario. So after the scenario, so asking them to change isn't like a couple of questions that were asked. One person asked why there would be a, a poor response to ADHD medication is that when you have a child with an FASD, he or she may not have ADHD. And ADHD may be a misdiagnosis. And in fact, Daniel Dubonsky will identify it's a common. Yeah. And yes, I will be talking about adults with this disability later on in the presentation. <clears throat> okay. Adaptive functioning in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Psychologists, everyone, this is a critical topic in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. If you have a student whom you suspect may have an FASD, it is very important, it is critical to test for adaptive functioning, no matter the IQ, because Adaptive functioning and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is typically one third to one half of IQ. And is the adaptive functioning is a key and core deficit area. One thing to know about adaptive functioning and FASD is that it gets worse with age starting in the teen years. This does not happen in ADHD. There seems to be an arrest that happens most often in social communication in FASD and not in ADHD, that there seems to be a more significant impairment in daily living for FASD versus ADHD. And again, across the IQ span, a poor sense of time and money and how that plays out in adulthood. That factor of poor understanding of risk or danger 
that may be, it plays out as not understanding who, what, and where is dangerous. And think about an adult out on the adult world without that ability. For older students, difficulty with employment and independent living. And in planning for his transition to adulthood, think adaptive functioning and dismaturity and the role and importance of interdependence and FASD. So adaptive functioning and testing for adaptive functioning and addressing adaptive function deficits is absolutely critical. Next slide. Motor functioning and FASD. The cerebellum is another area where damage often occurs. There can be deficits in fine motor or gross motor skills or both, but it is motor planning that is most affected. Uh, and in particular with tasks that require sequential actions. Think of the preschooler who's learning to dress him or herself, that sequential action. Um, this difficulty can sh be shown in balance and gait and use of scissors and learning to write and manipulation of toys and performing activities of daily living. And in infants, it's often shown with a poor suck and feeding difficulty. Next slide. So preschoolers, preschoolers often in, in school, in terms of their school lives, preschool may be the best time of their school lives. Some children will show early deficits and pre-academics and others begin to fail in school as the curriculum becomes more complex. Think about that transition to fourth grade, going to middle school and definitively high school. Um, how a preschooler with FASD can present. They're often very friendly, but they often have reduced stranger awareness. Be aware of that as a safety concern. I may mean, often show sensitivity to clothes and smells and touch and food and texture and sound. Some students will show meltdowns in your classroom. Other students will, up, will just shut down. There may be difficulty following rules that look like defiance, but that's not, that's not it. There may be difficulty with peers, and you may have a student who doesn't have breaks on the playground, a student who plays very hard on the playground and continues to play very hard well past the point of overwhelm. And please know that you have to be the breaks for that student. Your student may be reactive to changes in routine, transitions, or can be very hard for kids with FASD and that dismaturity factor. Preschoolers with FASD are at risk for speech and language uh, impairment. And a reason why, one of the reasons why early diagnosis is, is important, research has shown that choline, a supplement given in infancy and now in two to five year olds with FASD, it, kids that have taken choline supplementation show benefits for attention, memory, learning and behavior regulation. But without that diagnosis, without that identification, that opportunity is missed. Next slide, please. School age children. 80% of children and adults with FASD have sleep disorders. And it's not just difficulty falling asleep, it's actually fractured sleep cycles with constant waking so that the person may not get REM sleep. It's very important for us to think about the effect of such sleep on behavior and learning the next day. ADHD diagnoses are very common. That sensory processing issue again, and school-aged children, complex learning difficulties begin to be identified. And if you're going to see which subject is the most difficult, is most often math and FASD, a real math disability. Continuing receptive language and social communication deficit. And here's where the traditional discipline in the classroom, those sticker charts, those point systems, those consequences do not work. Decreased capacity for sustained effort and how that plays out in completing work in the classroom. Homework battles. Remember that difficulty in generalization, 
There may be behavior problems, meltdowns in your classroom. And children with FASD, adults and teens are often accused of stealing. The concept of ownership is abstract. So I have a ring on my hand and it's my ring. But if I take this ring off and I put it on the table, is it still my ring? What happens if I leave it on the table and I walk out of the room? Is that ring still mine? Ownership is an abstract concept and it is not stealing. Um, school age children may make friends but they have difficulty keeping them. And this is the time when mental health diagnoses begin to appear. Next slide. I'm going to skip this one because I think we're running out of time. Go to the next slide. Can we skip this one, please, Annette? I think I'm running out of time. I'm going to skip this one and go to the next slide. This that slide was by Daniel Dubofsky, who will be presenting after me, and he's talking about rewards and consequences and why they do not work and, and FASD and how students with FASD when those rewards and consequences are applied and they can't follow them, and then they lose that field trip, they lose that privilege, they, they lose that recess time, they are in effect being disciplined for their disability. Teams with FASD, so 16 going on eight or 16 going on 12, that dismaturity. Why do so many teens with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder drop out of school? Number one, the curriculum becomes more abstract and concrete thinking in FASD. Think about the curriculum in high school and how much more abstract it is and you've got a real concrete thinker. Difficulty with test taking in high school and FASD, poor retrieval of learned information. I mentioned I have a daughter who has this disability when she was in high school the head of her special education program told me once that to watch my daughter take a test was to watch a child in agony. There's an increased focus on written language, which is a core academic deficit area in high school and that math disability and the requirement for a high school diploma and high school math with algebra and geometry both being abstract concepts abstract subjects, a very key factor in dropping out, loss of friends, that immaturity factor and poor adaptive skills. Teens with FASD often don't fit in with peers and they don't fit in with the friends that they may have had when they were in elementary school. And since peers are paramount for a teen, what happens is teens with FASD often move to at-risk peer groups and there gets to be a core and important issue for staying safe in community. And I have to tell you, a big factor and dropout rate is that students with FASD are often disciplined and disciplined over and over for what is brain-based responses. And to be disciplined and to be thought less of and to be spoken to because of your disability is very adverse. What is the CDC telling us? That 29% of youth with FASD are expelled and 25% drop out of school. And what I'm telling you is we are failing these students and we simply have to do better. Next slide. So adulthood and transition. One of the things that is a clear recommendation in FASD is to delay the transition to adulthood. Why? Research is indicating that there's delayed maturation of the brain in this disability. And so a gift of time of not transitioning to adulthood at 18. Think also of the dismaturity, the social and emotional immaturity of the turning 18 year old. It is important to focus on adaptive functioning, functional academics, employability, and skills needed to live in community, and not just for students that are in a special day class, but for all students who have an FASD, no matter the IQ. 
It is very important to address, to come up with plans and role play and practice how one is going to address safety concerns for that teen and young adult and plan for the above. It is very important as a teen is approaching adulthood is to begin to build a circle of support. The goal in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is one of interdependence to build a circle of support. What supports that particular individual will need will depend upon that person. But it is a clear finding in FASD is a circle of support is needed. Look to the regional center for eligibility. Briefly in California, there are four named categories for regional center eligibility, but there is a fifth category. And people with FASD should qualify for regional center eligibility under the fifth category. Next slide, please. Um, Annette, can you please expand the view? Somebody asked um, about FASD versus ADHD. This is another core area of difference between fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and ADHD and a very important finding for understanding FASD, especially in the late teen and adult years. There are over 400 comorbid health conditions found in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, for instance, epilepsy occurs in 23% of this population. The general um, population, the prevalence is 1%. Hearing loss and vision deficits occur far more frequently in FASD. In FASD, there, are, there can be birth defects with a child born with heart, kidney, liver, or skeletal de um, birth defects. Uh, the autonomic nervous system is vulnerable. And, and remember, the development of every organ system in the body and utero can be affected by prenatal alcohol poisoning, depending upon the time of exposure. So um, common systems that are affected are respiratory, immune, endocrine, musculoskeletal, and digestive systems. So for instance, in women, diabetes is common. Metabolic disorders are common. Autoimmune disorders are common for both genders. And diseases of aging in teens and adults can occur in FASD. Next slide, please. Somebody asked about medication and FASD, and that's really is a whole topic by itself. Um, I am going to tell you that there is an algorithm that has been developed for the use of psychotropic medication in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. It was developed by a panel of international experts. If you would like to see the algorithm, uh, you can Google CAN, F-A-S-D, C-A-N, F-A-S-D. The algorithm is on their site. It gives first and second line recommendations for several different types of psychiatric difficulties and no, the recommendations are not the same in FASD as they are in the general population. And one of the things to understand in FASD is there often are atypical and paradoxical responses to medications. It's very common in fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. So that can be true for SSRIs and in anti-seizure medications. This group of people often show toxicity to anti-seizure medications at levels far below what is considered a starting therapeutic dose. So if you were that prescribing doctor or that prescribing psychiatrist, and you do not know that your patient has an FASD, would you like to be the one responsible for prescribing medications for that individual? Next slide. So does working with a child who has an FAD sound intimidating? It's actually not rocket science. Next slide. I'll briefly mention this because De Ebenson, uh, one of the authors of the Eight Magic Keys will be presenting at two o'clock today. She is wonderful. But 
One, keep it concrete. Consistency is vital and routine is important. So routine and structure are the glue of life in FASD. Plan for changes, practice with your student in advance, and structure is absolutely vital. Remember, transitions are difficult. Supervision is critical. Think of unstructured times in the classroom, the lunchroom, and recess. Repetition, know that there's learning loss. So yes, you're gonna to have to repeat and repeat again. Keep it simple. All those wonderful decorations in your classroom, think of your student with all the sensory processing deficits and recognize that less is more. And finally, really important to know about students with FASD, relationship is key. You have a student who very much wants to please. So use that. Next slide, please. Hi everyone, my name is Nate Sheets with Oregon Behavior Consultation and in this video we're going to be talking to teachers who are working with a child with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders or FASD. Most people are somewhat familiar with fetal alcohol. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorders is the group of disorders that a person can have due to being exposed to alcohol in utero. This disability is unique and it often doesn't present like many other disabilities that you've been used to. You may even be working with people with FASD who qualify for educational services under an autism criteria even though they're not actually autistic. They might also have some other kind of health impairment or some kind of emotional disturbance criteria. So here are six things that the parents of this child want you to know. The first and probably the most important and most difficult thing to understand and implement supports for is that people with FASD frequently do not understand verbal communication. I want you to think about the child who you're watching this video for and ask yourself if you see any indications that they're not understanding you. There's a good chance that when you think about it, you think, no, this person can understand me just fine. And that is where the problem lies. People with FASD frequently trick us. They're not doing it intentionally. It's a coping mechanism they've used to fit in socially. And fitting in socially for many people with FASD is is really important. People with FASD will frequently nod or say uh-huh or give other social cues such as repeating the last thing that you said that trick our brains into thinking that they understood but really not much was processed. Depending on the person they may only be catching one out of every seven or eight or nine words. This means that for you as the teacher, whenever you're having any kind of conversation, you need to be aware of how many words you're using and make sure you give them time to process. In your day-to-day -day job and trying to handle many students, this can be difficult. And what happens when somebody doesn't process what's being said is that later on they don't follow expectations. If you interpret that as them refusing or just not following through because they're lazy, that's an incorrect interpretation if what was going on was that the initial conversation was not supported enough for them to understand. We have some videos on how you can practically implement supports for receptive communication, which we'll link to in the description below. The second thing you should understand is that skills that are taught to people with FASD are frequently lost a day or two later. This is really interesting because they seem to really understand the skill when you teach it to them, and then when you ask them to recall the information, they're not able to. And people who are expected to perform skills that they don't have the ability to do are not gonna tell you, hey, I'm sorry, I'm having some kind of memory issue, I need some support, what they're gonna say is, I don't wanna do this, leave me alone. It's gonna look like they're refusing, but really what's going on is they don't have the ability to perform what you're requesting. So being aware that what you're teaching now may not stick later can help you find better ways to initially teach, including using visuals with the person or having somebody go through it with them several hours later and then maybe the next day in increments. The third and one of the most important things for you to understand is that people with FASD need time to process. If you're talking to them and implementing some receptive communication support so they can understand you, one of those supports is letting them think. And they need to be thinking essentially in silence. If you're having a conversation with someone or if there's too many distractions, they're going to be distracted and not be able to process what was just said. It's likely going to go in one ear and out the other. 
When we interact with kids, we tend to have a warped sense of perception ourselves. When I ask people how much time they think they give their child to think, frequently they think they're giving them 30 seconds to a minute. But really when I observe and track it for them, they're only giving about four to five seconds to actually let them think. This means that letting people think in silence is not something that comes natural to us, so you might actually have to count the seconds in your head to effectively give them that time. They might even give you an immediate answer, but you still want to give them that time to process because that immediate answer might be more impulsivity than really a well thought out response. The fourth thing you should understand, which we've kind of hit on already, is that people with FASD need more than just verbal communication. So being told how to do something and nothing else will not be effective. Some people do well with some kind of visuals showing them or telling them what to do. Other people need to actually be shown by another person potentially several times. The fifth thing to remember is that when somebody with FASD is escalated, talking to them will not be effective. We tend to want to try to verbally maintain situations before they get out of control, but people with FASD do not do well with that verbal input. This is because they don't have the ability to process what's being said as well as emotionally regulate, which are done in two different areas of the brain. By being quiet, we can allow them to start to regain some of that emotional regulation and get to a point where they can calm down and we can make a plan to move forward. And again, remember, in that moment, they're not going to tell you, I need you to stop talking. They're going to be cursing at you and yelling at you if they're very escalated. So don't take it personally and you really shouldn't punish them for it because this is a direct result of their disability. The best thing you can do is have a plan with your student about what they can do when they get escalated and then you practice that plan. Ideally, they will be able to go into a different environment to kind of get their sensory system under control and to be alone and to save face from their peers. The benefit of having a plan that you make with the student and then practice with them several times when they're in a good space is that when the time comes, you can have a nonverbal prompt and prompt them to follow the plan. This means you don't have to talk and that can reduce some immediate opposition and it allows them to think. So you might show them some kind of visual prompt and you guys have practiced what this means, what they can do. It might take them a minute or two to process and to stop being oppositional, but once they gain some skills, they can follow the plan and then more quickly de-escalate and get back on track. We want to remember that escalations where you're successfully able to follow the plan and de-escalate the student are not bad things. It's actually a really good thing. The more they can follow the plan and de-escalate, the better they're going to get at it and hopefully at one point they'll be able to emotionally regulate just by sitting in their desk with a prompt. And the sixth thing to remember is that whenever you're getting inaccurate information from a person with FASD, do not assume that it's lying. We have a video on some of the perception issues in fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, and a big reason for what appears to be lying is impulsivity. For example, if we ask a kid what happened at school today, and they immediately answer with nothing, they probably haven't actually thought the answer through. So we don't want to be framing questions in a way where they are impulsively answering, because then we might interpret it as a lie when really that's not what's going on. Something that I do with my clients is I invite them to think, because many of them have learned over time that they should just answer questions right away. So what you want to do is say something like, don't answer right away, just think about this, and then step away so they can think, and then come back after a minute or two and hear what their answer is. You can also encourage them to write out their thoughts. That might help them slow down and think about what they really want to say. Of course, they have to have writing skills to be able to do this. You also might need to give them a lot of extra time if what you're talking about is either potentially triggering or complicated. So you might say something like, after lunch, we're going to have this conversation. You're not in trouble. I just want you to start thinking about what we can do or what the problem was or whatever the context of that conversation is. So those are the six things I want you to remember in terms of the skills of somebody with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. But another thing I want you to remember is how this impacts families. You might be watching this video wondering if any of this applies to your student. Maybe you haven't seen them have behaviors, or maybe they do well academically. This is very common, but what frequently happens is that these kids put in so much energy to do well at school that once they get home, we see some very, very challenging behaviors. These behaviors can take many forms, but frequently involve intense physical aggression, intense verbal aggression, 
property destruction, using items as weapons, running away, and many others. It's likely that you're receiving this video as a proactive way to try to avoid a lot of the behaviors that you might eventually see if the student continues to experience frustration. The parents are trying to help you be successful. There are many, many school situations where parents advocate for these supports. They're not given because the school district does not see that the supports are needed, and then once the behaviors start, those supports can't be put in place because the district has suspended or expelled the student or displaced them to a completely different environment. That is what this video seeks to avoid. So depending on your relationship with these parents, they might seem intense a little bit of the time, they might sometimes be a little bit of a pain, but there are reasons for this. You can find out more information on FASD by watching the various videos in this channel. You also might find that a lot of our videos will be helpful for a variety of students. You can support us by subscribing to this YouTube channel or liking the Organ Behavior Consultation page on Facebook. Thanks for watching. Next slide, please. So I'm only going to be able to do a brief introduction, but if I was going to recommend one book for you to get, it would be by this author, Diane Malbin, Trying Differently Rather Than Harder. And it's a book that changed my life as a parent and it changed my life as an educator. It is, she has framed a way of working with children and teens and adults who have an FASD. And the, the key to being an effective um, teacher or provider for a student who has an FASD is to keep a clear focus on the brain basis for the learning and behavior deficits that you see. And the critical phrase to remember is to think can't, not won't, that it's the neurology of the student. It's how his or her brain works. And this requires a different view of your student and, and, your, and of yourself. The emphasis is not on changing the student, but on what you do. So it, it means adjusting your expectations. It means thinking, what does the brain need to do to be able to do in order to complete the task I just gave the student. Ask yourself, does my student have the cognitive skills needed to do this task? And if not, what support do I need to put into place? We think the use of traditional discipline techniques and the use of consequences. So again, those sticker charts, those reward systems, that uh, just, they not only don't work, they are actually can be very frustrating for a student with FASD who then loses his or her privileges, loses that field trip and doesn't understand why. And then actually I'm gonna turn a concept on its head and I want you to rethink what it means to enable. Instead of the negative connotation, I'm gonna tell you that to enable means to make able. And that for individuals who have an FASD, as I said, what will be needed will look differently for each person. But the general concept is, is that the goal is for interdependence and building supports to allow that person to live in community, to have a job and stay safe. So enable, to make able. And uh, the next slide, please. Multi-sensory teaching is an absolute must. So tell me and I forget, show me, I remember, involve me, I understand. Multi-sensory teaching and FASD. So the use of social stories, especially with younger children, and the use of visuals with oral directions for instruction and to practice. Remember that difficulty and processing language and what other cognitive supports do you need to put into place to allow your student to be able to understand and perform. Also critical in thinking about intervention for students with an FASD is to think about the strengths of your student and teach her his or her strengths and interests. 
So I happened to have a daughter who in second grade had not learned to read yet. And her teacher recognized that she had a great love of animals and natural history. And guess who learned to read using National Geographic? It was a perfect example. Individuals with FASD are often very good hands-on learners. Emphasize hands-on learning and activities and give lots of opportunity for learning by doing. Model more and say less. For instance, rules have only a few rules at a time and use role play and restate often. Not only modeling, but role playing is a key technique in working with students with FASD. So they cannot just hear what they're supposed to do, but they can actually practice and do what they're supposed to do in advance. Emphasize creativity, which is often a strength in FASD. To think about your student who's good in art, who's good in music, or perhaps good in poetry, and teach using those modalities and give that student a chance to shine in your classroom. And math, that specific math disability in FASD, it's a key deficit area. And no, just teaching a skill that was supposed to be learned earlier in the same way that it was not learned the first and second time is not going to work the third time. And FASD, think multisensory teaching that systematically teaches from concrete to semi-concrete to abstract. And for older students, please, in high school where they're changing classes, make sure that there's support for organization for assignments and, and, and support in getting that done. I wish that I had more time to actually talk more about intervention, but at two o'clock we have Deb Evanson, who's an international expert on intervention in FASD, who will be speaking then. Are there questions that um, to be answered? Peg, the one overwhelming question that I see, um, and it's written many different ways, is that um, the difficulty when you can't get your child diagnosed because lack of confirmation or facial skills, um, so not having a diagnosis in the school system, and it's from both teachers and I think parents, educators and parents, what do you do um, if you can't get that diagnosis to then, you know, require this, the, the accommodations and the, um, I, th I, the I think this is a question that comes up um, quite often, and, and my answer is one that I wish I had a better answer. But in order to get a diagnosis, if there is fetal alcohol syndrome, you do not need confirmation of prenatal alcohol exposure because the cardinal features, the cardinal physical features of the syndrome are present. Otherwise, if you are the 90% that are on the spectrum, but do not have fetal alcohol syndrome, then diagnosis does require confirmation of prenatal alcohol exposure. I saw one question that's for instance, if a child was in foster care. I do know of parents who have children whom they have adopted that were in foster care that were able to reach out to the family that reached out to the social workers and were ultimately were able to get confirmation of prenatal alcohol exposure. It doesn't have to be medical confirmation. You can speak to a family member. You can get confirmation that there was drinking during the pregnancy. If you cannot get, I've even heard of some families in international adoption that have gone back to the orphanages and been able to get confirmation, but this is a tricky area. And my general answer is, if you have a student that is showing the characteristics of a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, my answer is, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, treat it like a duck because the accommodations and the, and the FASD informed interventions are not going to hurt that student. In fact, they could be helpful for many students who are in special education. So you implement the plan and you do the best for the student that you have before you.